Good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you, Steve, for, for the introduction. Uh, in this presentation, we will be describing the way the track quality standard deviations are used and sometimes misused as parameters in the design and construction of track alignments. So between S and C and uh, X and Y, we will add some SDEs. Uh, one of the reasons I am uh, here on the stage today is that about a year ago, I gave a presentation to the PWI section in Glasgow, where I discussed about the uh, track quality measurement and the way uh, the track quality is uh, assessed. <clears throat> this presentation was based on various uh, technical documents and standards I studies, and for the design part, uh, on my experience in using a software called the TGSD calculator, <clears throat> developed by David Mayer, my co-presenter. This software is often used in the track design process to calculate what we call the inherent uh, standard deviations. There are some technical documents that suggest that the um, TGSD calculator is based on, the, on a dynamic modeling and on computing the vehicle accelerations caused by the design. And in, uh, in my presentation, I uh, supported this, uh, this uh, uh, statement. This inherent, which uh, uh, was uh, suggesting, as I said, that uh, the inherent design standard deviations are, are proportional to the additional vehicle acceleration induced by the changes in, uh, in the track uh, uh, geometry. Sometimes the SD is calculated by the designer, <clears throat> uh, are suggested to be adjust, lowered, uh, because these SDs are affecting the standard targets um, for installation and maintenance. In November last year, uh, David Woods asked me to present at this conference, um, and <coughs> He also got me in touch with uh, David, with David Marriott, and after a few phone calls with uh, him, I started to see that my understanding of what these uh, inherent standard deviations are and how this software is working um, was wrong. So my understanding of this, I found out that was not exactly what uh, I thought to be. And because this misunderstanding is not only mine, we decided together to, to give a joint presentation and to clarify what are these inherent uh, standard deviations and what the TGSD calculator really does. And the best person to present this is David Marriott, the engineer who developed the software. So David, you have the stage. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm David Marriott and I, back in the day, worked at British Rail Research and when privatisation came around I set up on my own, uh, primarily doing uh, work on systems for track maintenance machine control of ballast cleaners and so on. <clears throat> so, I produced the TGSD calculator that uh, Constantine's referred to as a simple tool to allow Network Rail to work around a problem that they'd created in uh, the specification for construction. I had no idea since doing that that Network Rail would use it, start to use it in a completely different way and as Constantine has just described, which I now understand to be quite widespread. Hopefully in this presentation I can correct some of these misunderstandings and uh, Maybe some changes will have to be made to the specifications for track construction and design. So, what do we mean by track quality standard deviations? We mean the four values produced for each eighth mile by the track recording car. So, that's worst top 35, mean top 70 metre, and alignment 35 and 70 metre. I'm going to call, refer to them collectively as TRC-SDs. 
Now, there's a lot of ground to cover, and it'd probably take a half-day workshop to cover it all fully, so I'm going to whisk through this. It's probably going to be the case that you won't understand this fully. Don't worry about that. It's because I'm skipping over quite a lot of detail. What you might go away with an understanding is that what you thought the SDs represented isn't quite the case, and that you can't necessarily use them in the way you have been using them. Okay, so first of all, let's just look at the track recording car and what it actually measures. It's got what they call an inertial box, so it's an inertial reference system which contains accelerometers which measure acceleration of the box in the three mutually perpendicular axes. If you integrate an acceleration value, you produce a velocity value, so you can get the velocity of the box in the three axes. If you integrate the velocity value, you can get a position value in the three axes. So if you do this double integration, you can record the position of the box in 3D space or in relative to the three axes. Also in the box, there are gyroscopes in the three axes which measure the rotation of the box. So now you've got the orientation of the axes of the box relative to planet Earth. The net result is you get a position in 3D space of the box which is attached to the vehicle body, usually, or above the primary suspension, at least. You then have optical or other scanners that can measure the position of the vehicle body relative to the two rails. So by little bits of triangulation, you can get the position of the two rails in 3D space as the vehicle runs along the track. Okay. So, what do we get out of this? Imagine we've got a billiard table, flat, straight bit of railway with some track sitting on it which has got irregularities in it. We run the track recording car over it and we can produce a vertical profile of the track. Yeah? So it's just the height above some arbitrary datum. Once we've got that shape, we can determine various things from it, such as the peak-to-peak -peak maximum along a section of track. We can also look at exceedances, where we've got a level we set, and check whether we've got an exceedance of that level. We can also look at a measure of general roughness of that track. So that's what the track recording car is producing for us on billiard table flat straight track. What happens when we measure some track that isn't flat and straight. Well, here's a vertical profile of some track which has got straight grades, vertical curves, there's some cant in there as well. And you can see, uh, and with the same irregularity of surface, but it's lost completely in the general profile of all the gradient change. And we've got scale now in metres along the side instead of millimetres. So... We can't use this for measuring peak-to-peaks or exceedances or even roughness on the face of it. So what do we do? Well, we can use a filter. <coughs> but what is a filter in the context of this data? Well, it removes the long wavelength parts of that measured profile. Okay? We can tune it to a specific wavelength called the cutoff wavelength, so that shorter wavelengths in that measured profile will pass through the filter, and longer wavelengths will be removed. <coughs> now, our designed geometrical shape is generally long wavelength. Those grades and vertical curves and even the cant changes. And the irregularities that we're really interested in, that we might want to correct by tamping, for instance, are generally short wavelengths. So let's have a look at what happens when we use this filter. There's our profile again. And when we filter it, you can see our scale's gone back to millimetres. Yeah, and we've removed all the design geometrical shape out of our filter profile, out of our profile, measured profile. And the filtered profile, right, we can now go back to looking at exceedances and general roughness and peak to peaks or whatever we like. Okay? And the way we measure general roughness 
is to use a standard deviation. So just our formula for calculating a standard deviation, we're just going to chop our filtered profile into eighth mile sections. For each eighth mile section, we're going to look at all the data points for height of the track, filtered height of the track. Then use that formula to calculate the SD. As you can see, we've got the SDs all listed there for each eight mile, 70 meter filtered mean top. So that's what the track recording coach does to produce the 70 meter mean top SD that you see on your results that you obtain from the recording coach. Now, the choice of filter wavelength and the choice of a four pole Butterworth filter, which is the one that we use to filter that data, um, was decided by the UIC. Um, but it had been pioneered, if you like, by British Rail, British Rail Research, and they had traditionally used a 35 metre cutoff wavelength for the short one, but other UIC members used 25 metres, and a 70 metre wavelength for the long one. I believe it had originally, if you go back into the history, it had been a, a 42 metre filter and an 84 metre filter, but it was a three pole Butterworth. And this change was made to align British Rail with other UIC members. Okay. So why 35 and 70? Well, it's really dictated by what you're going to use that data for. We could measure all kinds of wavelengths in the surface of the track. You can see the short ones are really, really rail shape issues. Yeah, corrugation, bent welds, or even wheel problems. And the only thing you can do with that is to bend or grind the rail <coughs> to correct the problem. Okay. Slightly longer ones, you can do some, design or some automatic tamping, which takes out relatively short wavelengths, up to 35 metres. 35 to 70, you can use design tamping to remove those. So that's why we look at 35 and 70, because it's generally what the tamping machines can treat. Okay, so when the TRC was first developed, the SDs were used to indicate the general level of roughness of the track, and bands were defined for each track category, where the SD, if it was less than a certain value, would be called good, if it was above that value but less than another value, and in different bands, satisfactory, poor, and very poor. And the idea was that you would have a percentage target for each of those bands. So for instance, and this is just from my recollection, at least 50% of the track had to be in the good band. 75% had to be satisfactory or good, and only 10% could be in the very poor band. And that was collecting all the eighth mile SDs for a certain length of track, and then you would have a measure of track quality for that section of route. Stafford crew or something like that. Now, <clears throat> when privatisation happened, we got a whole load of new interfaces between all the various component parts of the railway industry to do with track. And people started to use these SDs in a different way. Okay? So, for instance, in the interface between the infrastructure owner and the tamping contractor, you might use SD for a particular eighth mile as an indication of the track quality of that eighth mile. Now, that's subtly different from the previous way of interpreting the SDs. Because you're saying that the track quality for that eighth mile for that parameter, 70 metre alignment, is poor, okay? And you're dividing all your track up into eight miles like that. <coughs> now, as we'll see in a little while, it's not true to say that when the value of an eighth mile SD is in the poor band, it indicates that that track is poor quality. It could be in that band for a different reason. So, this is not an absolute measure of track quality. And 
This all came to a head in around about 2005 when Network Rail introduced SDs as a measure of track quality for construction standards. And basically what this said was that for track renewals, the SDs as measured by the recording car, or the as-built track, had to be in the good band, okay, for the relevant track category. And this created a problem because, um, we'll just go back one concept, okay. Okay. In cases where the as-built SDs were not in the good band, the contractor was penalised for the non-compliance when he bid for future work. The non-compliance would count against him. But contractors were finding that even though they'd installed the track properly to the design alignment, all within the tolerances and the specification, when it was measured with a track recording car, it wasn't in the good band. It was in satisfactory or even poor sometimes. So they were complaining to Network Rail, we seem to have done all this properly, but we're getting a black mark against our name because of this non-compliance. Now the engineer at the time understood that the issue of the track quality SD was related to the design geometry of the track. So he investigated and found that these issues where the contractor was complaining were associated with a lot of design geometry, transitions and vertical curves and so on. <clears throat> Thanks. Right, now, so let's look at the effect of this filtering that we did on some perfectly aligned track now. So this vertical profile here is just the design shape of the track without any irregularity at all. Now, you would imagine that when we recorded that with an imaginary recording car for this imaginary track, we would get a perfect zero figure for our SD. Yeah? But that's not what happens. What happens when we filter is we get this line here. But when we draw to a higher scale, a smaller scale, we can see that there's all this apparent irregularity in the filtered profile. We'll just go to the last bit. So, and of course this contributes to a non-zero SD. When you chop it all up and calculate the SDs, it's not zero at all. <coughs> now, here the numbers, the SD numbers are quite small, and that'll be the case for a lot of track. But in certain circumstances where you've got a lot of design geom geometrical changes, yeah, that filtered profile can be more irregular and therefore the SDs can be bigger. So, how is this happening? <laughs> okay, let's look a bit closer at what our filter's doing, because that's the key to this. If we look at uh, how the filter behaves, if we filter a cosine wave, so this isn't really track now, this is just looking at what the filter does. The wavelength of the cosine wave is 20 metres. We've got a 70 metre cutoff wavelength of our filter, and we can see that the output in orange is very close to the input you know, in red. So where the, where the wavelength is a lot shorter than the cutoff, you know, we're getting virtually no change. For an intermediate wavelength, here it's 50 metres with a cutoff of 70, we can see that what the filter's done is it's apparently shifted, it's made it slightly smaller, but it's shifted the orange, the red wave, down the track a bit. Yeah. And then when we look at a very long wavelength, 150 metres, we can see that what the filter's done is probably what we expect is to remove all the wavelength altogether. It's virtually zero. Yeah. But our de design geometry doesn't consist... Oh, we'll, we'll look at our... our can we look at the transfer function? Just to show you there's a transfer function, it's called a frequency response, which shows you how much the amplitude of the output changes relative to the input for a given filter cutoff. Okay. But our design geometry doesn't consist of cosine waves, it consists of 
for instance, a continuous vertical gradient. So what would the filter do on a continuous vertical gradient? In actual fact, it produces zero. There's actually rounding errors in, <laughs> in the spreadsheet that's done this that show slight variation, but essentially it's a zero what we get out. What about uh, a circular curve, which you would have, or a vertical parabola? So that's a vertical curve or a constant radius curve in alignment. What happens when we filter that with the filter? Again, we get zero output. Yeah? Now, our design vertical profile only consists of straight gradients, straight camp ramps, and vertical parabolas. So, having looked at this, we would expect our filter, when it filtered our design geometry that only comprised those elements, to produce zero. But as we could see, it didn't. It included all that strange variation. So, let's look at another design element, which is where a gradient changes. Yeah? And let's see what happens when we filter that with our <coughs> filter. We get this strange thing that looks like a damped oscillation of some kind. Yeah? And how about if we look at the ends of a vertical curve? When we filter those, we get a different kind of damped oscillation looking thing. Sorry for interrupting you. Yep. This the case is it's just a matter of uh, reduction of travel if you come from the other side. Of yeah, the, the filter is actually um, not symmetrical. So that if you filter the data in one direction, you'll get one answer, and you filter it in the other direction, you'll get a different answer. And that's the case with the track recording car as well. If you run it down some track in one direction, you'll get one set of numbers. And if you run it on the same bit of track in the opposite direction, even accounting for left and right hand rails changing, you will get a different set of numbers because the filter will be behaving differently on the different data. <coughs> OK. And just for completeness, here's a horizontal curve change where we've got a transition. So this graph at the top is now in curvature. Yeah, and we can see at the ends of the, ver of the horizontal curvature transition, we get blips again. So, if we go, can we go back to that slide of the whole thing? Keep going back, slide 12, whatever it is. Okay. Keep going. Whoa. One more. Whoa, that's it. These things here are just a collection of all those single instantaneous changes and what the filter does to them. And to describe them, I've, I've described them as artefacts. And I can only illustrate that with an analogy, which is a map of the world, which is the representation on a flat plane of the globe. And we get distortions. So, for instance the distance between London and Tokyo measured on the <laughs> flat plane scale is different to the actual distance on the surface of the globe. And in particular, the north and south poles, instead of being points, have become lines of length the same as the circumference of the equator. Okay? They're not really there. Yeah? It's just the consequence of using the Mercator projection to produce this on a flat plane. And those wiggles are the consequence of using the filter where our design geometry has those instantaneous changes. Okay. How are we for time? Three minutes. Okay. Do you want to give your examples? No. Okay. Just right. So, this problem with the construction standards needed to be resolved. So what the engineer at Network Rail asked me to do was to produce this little calculator so that instead of assuming that the track in the renewals could be made zero SD, he wanted to calculate what it would be if it was perfect. Yeah? So you input to this calculator your design geometry and what it produces is the SDs that the recording car would measure 
if it ran over that perfect design geometry. And now, instead of the construction standard saying that the SD had to be in the good band, it says the SD has to be within a particular tolerance of the design SD, or as we became later to call it, the inherent SD that's there because of the design geometry. Okay. So all this is doing is calculating the SDs that you would get because of these, what I've called, artifacts of the filter. They're not real shapes in the real track. But they will appear when the real track recording car measures real track, which has that design shape, because it has that filter in it. Okay. And now we will look quickly through a few examples just to understand what's the impact of all these uh, artifacts. So here it's a trace, a measured trace uh, of a section of track. And we have one new SNC just installed, an old SNC to be removed, a bearing change here, and a compound curve with two transitions. If we calculate the SDs of these, these are the values. And if we insert the, if we check how the artifact of the filtering is influencing this, this is the artifact. So the, in fact, the SDs of the artifact are these figures. So in some, sorry, in these sections here, where we have significant alignment changes, part of that SD that we are measuring with the track recording car is due to the alignment geometry and not to the track quality, of the, uh, not to the track irregularities themselves. And this is why the track, the, the, these artifacts are in influencing the, the SDs. Although these things here do not really exist on track. So on track we have a transition, a continuous curve, and another transition. We don't have this shape on track. And there is an element that I will discuss quickly later. There are some sections where the measure SD here is less than the track quality of the design, the, the track the SD of the design, which is kind of strange. But this doesn't mean that that track quality is better than, than uh, an ideal perfect track. And this is the next year trace. Again, we have two sections where the SDs of the uh, recorded track are better than the design of this. Uh, but we will look quickly through a few, a few examples. The first one, it's quite a dramatic one. Uh, it's a sudden drop in the vertical profile. Uh, a sudden drop of 1.8 meters. 1.8 meters is this much. This much, yeah? <laughs> drop in the vertical profile. What do you think the... SDs of this design would be. This is the artifact, and if you calculate the SDs, are 0 0.242, quite low. I had alignments with way greater than this than that. Does this mean that the SDs are a measurement of the track quality of the design? I think this single example proves that they are not. But let's look now on some real design examples. So this is uh, the case of a 800 meters uh, radius curve with a counter of 150 and two transitions of 100 meters. If we pass this, if we insert this in the TGSD calculator and calculate the SDs, we have the worst top and mid top values of uh, the SDs for the design of 0, 0.72 and 104. If we insert the cant as a negative value, so we have negative cant minus 
150, we see that the rate of change in deficiency is dramatically increased. The deficiency is <laughs> over the limit. We might have the train derailed over this section of track, but the SDs are the same. This is another element that proves that there is no direct relation between the design SDs and the quality of that design. And you can check this if you have the software. Negative cant, when passed through the filter, will leave a similar artifact with the normal cant. If we remove the cant, so we have this as the figures, but if we remove the cant, we have the cant deficiency of 244, way above the limit, but the top SDs are zero. <laughs> Is the design in this case better? Obviously not. The only uh, part when, where the SDs of a design are correlated in a way with the uh, improvement in, in, uh, in that design is where we are inserting, where, when we are inserting, inserting sorry, longer design elements. So here is a case of a, of a design with a 17 meter length transition. The rates of change are below the uh, uh, maximum uh, value of 55. The SDs are very, the, the alignment SD for 70 meter uh, cut of uh, wavelength is uh, 385. Sorry. It's above the limits that are imposed in the 202 standard. So, what should we do? Should we change this design? If we try to change the design to lower that SD, if we bring the rate of change to 34, so below 35, the SD is still big. So the best figure we'll get when we elongate that transition to 160. Is this alignment better? From the point of view of the rates of change of CAN and CAN deficiency, of course, yes. The alignment 70 meter SD is indeed lower. But as we discussed before, there is no real relationship between the design SD and the quality of the track. Longer alignment elements are preferred in a good design. Obviously, we want to install longer design elements, but sometimes we are constrained by the real location, and we are forced to go to the uh, to higher values of the rates of change, the rates of uh, change, uh, change of current deficiency. This, in this case, the better design, if we try to install it, we will need a 900 mil shift slew of the track. Sometimes we don't have a meter to shift the track laterally to install this transition. So even though it looks better on paper, on my computer it might be perfectly designed, we cannot install it on track. Uh, another thing yeah, is related to the way we deal with these figures. As we saw before, even though it's this artifact is just a product of the filtering. It doesn't exist on track. So it's an artificial thing, but it's influencing the measurement. It's present in the track recording car as this. It's present in track recording car uh, uh, trace. So we simulated some uh, uh, case studies to see how we can uh, deal with this. So for this section of track, <clears throat> the track recording car trace will give 425, and the design alignment SDs are 384. Uh, one way to deal with this, suggested in some of the technical documents we all know, is to calculate the difference between the two SDs. The difference is 044, but is the track quality of this section really 0.24? Uh, well, the one thing to, to state here is that the standard deviation is the uh, 
square root of the average, um, I cannot even say, yeah? <laughs> It's a very complex formula. You cannot do simple math with this. The standard deviation of a measurement, if we subtract the standard deviation of another me measurement, we will not get the standard deviation of difference of the, those two measurements. It's just here a set of random numbers, here another set of number, uh, random numbers. So we simulated this with uh, three case studies and I've placed them in an increasing order from the point of view of the SD dif uh, uh, difference. But if we check what the SDs of the track regularities really are, we see that this one, which from the point of view of the SD difference is apparently the worst, is in fact the best of the three. And this one is really the worst and above the good limit in the track maintenance standard. So, in fact, we cannot do mathematical operations with this. What can we do? One way is what we already, what we already, we are already doing to review the rate of deterioration for the uh, uh, SDs from one measurement to the next. But the other better way to do it is to subtract the artifact from the recording trace and to calculate the SDs of that. I'll jump to the conclusions now. <coughs> The design alignment is these, sorry, the design alignment is not entirely filtered from the track recording trace. We have in that trace an artifact of the design. <coughs> this artifact does not exist on track, but is influencing the SD calculated by the track recording car. Because the track recording car SDs are not an absolute measurement of the track quality, they are influenced by this uh, artifacts. A large SD does not necessarily mean a large track irregularity. And when large track, track quality is, uh, TRC SDs are present in maintenance, are present, maintenance resources could be wasted attempting to correct irregularities that they don't really exist on track. And the cost of this we cannot estimate. From the point of view of the design, the TGSD calculator the tool developed by David Marriott calculate the, uh, calculates the standard deviations of the design alignment filtered through this Butterworth filter. There is no dynamic modeling in all this. There is no relationship between the accelerations of the track of the vehicle over that section of track and this SD is calculated by the uh, SD calculator. And the design al alignment standard deviations are not closely related to the quality of the design of the installed track, as we proved. That would be quickly it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.